So our next speaker, you're going to be absolutely thrilled with our next speaker. She comes from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a professor. She's a planetary scientist. She has been dubbed by NASA Quest as the Indiana Jones in exoplanet searching. She has received numerous accolades and awards. It is absolutely my pleasure and I am so thrilled to have this presenter here today. Please give a loud and warm welcome to Dr. Sarah Seeger. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Well, my first question for you is how many of you have been to a truly dark sky? Great, that's what I was expecting. Actually, I was expecting 100%. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you about exoplanets. And the next time you go out and look up at the night sky, that'll probably be tonight, you can wonder about the stars out there and whether or not there are planets around each of those stars. Uh, to get started, to help you understand what is an exoplanet and how many there are, I have this animation called Eyes on Exoplanets. Actually, it's a software you can download, so you can go home later and Google Eyes on Exoplanets and download it. And just excuse me, because this animation clip that was made from the software, it goes really fast, so I have to talk super fast <laughs> to get through it. So it starts out with this illustration of our galaxy, but quickly zooms in to a real map of our sky. All those highlighted stars, yellow and red, are actually stars with known exoplanets. And in fact, the software also has a spacecraft that orbit our sun and satellites, and it will, you can actually go anywhere on Earth. And here it takes us to the west coast of North America in the spring night sky. And if you click on it, you can actually see the stars outside at your night that have known exoplanets. Put the constellations out, zoom around, Actually, it takes us to a very special patch of the sky. Does anyone know what that patch is? It's actually a special place where a space telescope, Kepler, yes, Kepler Space Telescope, stared at one patch of the sky for about four years and found so many planets. Now, if you know the name of a favorite planet, you can type it in. And this one is Kepler-186. So the software takes us to the star, and look, there are five planets around that star, and these orbits are to scale. It also, you can click on this menu, and find the so-called Goldilocks or habitable zone, a region around the star where a planet as heated by the star would be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Here it goes a little too far, and if you can read the fine print, it says, hypothetical visualization of planets. <laughs> so we can't see other planets around other stars like that, but I wanted you to be able to um, see this night sky software and just appreciate just how many stars out there have planets. Now, one thing is that uh, most of these stars, you need your binocular to see the star at all. And of course, with your naked eye or most of your telescopes, you wouldn't be able to know that there's a planet there. So one thing about these planets, um, we don't know too much about them. So remember that planet Kepler 186F. So NASA made some travel posters to help us think about exoplanets because we, we can't yet go there. This one says Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. Experience the gravity of HD 40307G, a super-Earth. This is imagining an exoplanet, this particular one, that is more massive than Earth, that has a more higher surface gravity. So if we could go to that planet, we would have a lot of trouble walking around. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. <laughs> and it's one of a number of different planets known that has two suns. The planet orbits two suns. Oh, they're gas giants, but I'm, su I'm absolutely sure there are also terrestrial planets out there orbiting two suns. We just haven't been able to find them yet. And so what I always like to say about this particular system, <laughs> science fiction got some things right. So for our exoplanets, I have now just a little bit of a more quantitative, although somewhat out of date, graph to show you. And this is showing you a large number of the known exoplanets. Each dot represents a different planet, showing you its uh, size as a function of its uh, orbital period. 
And this is what we call on a logarithmic scale. It covers a vast amount of area. You can see a line showing you um, where Earth would be at one Earth radius. And uh, we have a Neptune size, Jupiter, et cetera. And these are orbital period and days. So Earth would be about here in this dark part of the diagram. It's fair to say that our telescopes, no matter how sophisticated, can't reach to that part of the diagram yet. Um, the other thing I want you to see is that just how many planets there are. And they actually come in all masses and sizes and orbits. It's just phenomenal that, in fact, we have not found a solar system copy yet. Our solar system turns out to be very hard to find with any planet finding technique. Can you see where this diagram is most dense, where there are the most planets, the most common type of planet? It's not a very scientific approach, but nonetheless, you can see where it's all dark there. That's because all the planets are overlaying each other. The most common type of planet we know of so far are planets about two to three times the size of Earth. They're smaller than Neptune, but larger than Earth. And believe it or not, we don't know how these formed or why there are so many of them, because, and there are no solar system counterparts. So when I see this diagram, I like to think, in exoplanets, anything is possible. So just to conclude this introductory part of my talk, what is an exoplanet? A planet that orbits a star other than our sun. We know of thousands of exoplanets. We don't know a lot about most of them, their masses and orbits. We know about multiple planet systems. And we know just how bizarre these other worlds might be. So to make progress, that's what my talk is about today, is to tell you a bit about what's going on and where we're um, getting. And so I'm going to divide my talk into two parts, a two-step approach to finding a habitable world. The first one is with existing telescopes or those under construction. You've already heard more than once about the James Webb Space Telescope, for example. And then the future, I'll be talking about new space-based facilities. And while you're wondering what I might mean, you can uh, browse the props we've brought up. And I'll get to that in the second part of my talk. So to start with, here is just a Apollo image of Earth and our sun, not to scale. <laughs> but I wanted you to know that actually for like educational and popular astronomy purposes, we're very lucky. Our Earth is approximately, just approximately, 100 times smaller than the sun. It's 100,000 times, actually it's a, 100,000 times less massive than the sun, and about, unfortunately, 10,000 billion times fainter than the sun. So if you were going to set out to find another Earth, which technique would you use? One that involves a planet size? You're talking about 100 times smaller, or 10,000 times in area. Uh, mass, which involves about 100,000 times smaller, or 10 billion. Because you know our Earth isn't necessarily so hard to find. The problem is it's right beside a big, massive, bright sun. So anyone want to guess? 100, 100,000, 10 million. <laughs> well, the way we find most planets today is by size, because that's the easiest way we have. And here's a little animation to show you. Can you see the little planet going in front of the star? It's supposed to be the size of Earth going in front of a star the size of our sun. But what we're doing as astronomers is we're looking at that bottom graph. We're looking at untold numbers of stars, thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably a million stars looking for a little tiny drop in brightness. I want you to imagine that you're out there with your telescope, or actually it would be out there robotically, taking an image of the sky every few seconds or every few minutes, over and over and over again. And that's what the Kepler Space Telescope did. That's what a lot of astronomers in the professional community are doing with specially made telescopes. And we're just looking for that tiny drop in brightness to find planets that go in front of uh, their star. So in that particular case, there's whole tons of information in this light curve. If you can measure this very precisely, you could learn the density of the star. You could look for moons as well. You could look for multiple planets by the different shape and depth and duration of the planet light curve. Believe it or not, in astronomy nowadays, you can do an entire PhD just on subtle factors in the planet light curve. And you can have data good enough to pull incredible things out. Now I'm going to get to some real data. And how many of you have heard of the TRAPPIST-1 planet? So the TRAPPIST-1 system is a breathtakingly amazing planetary system with seven planets. So I'm going to give you a little more insight into it by showing you this data. It's hard to believe that this created such a huge attention in the media. But this is actually what it was, what we saw, astronomers saw. Now what this is showing you is a data set taken from space. So it's no longer you imagining yourself in your backyard with your telescope and your camera imaging a star field. It's now a telescope in space called the Spitzer Space Telescope, 
which if you haven't heard of it, we sometimes think of it as Hubble's infrared cousin. It works in the infrared. It's in an Earth trailing heliocentric orbit. And the good thing is it doesn't have a day and night because it's out in space far away from Earth now. And this data, if you can look at the bottom, which is time, it's taken over 21 days. So 21 days and 21 nights, a space telescope stared at one star. This telescope's about 80 centimeters in diameter, its aperture. And what you can see is look at the y-axis, or the relative brightness, normalized to one, and you can see it's very uh, precise photometry. So we're measuring the brightness time after time, a minute after minute, essentially. Uh, it looks like there's some gaps in the data when the telescope wasn't working. But can you see the transits here? They're actually all squished together now. But these transits typically last an hour to a few hours. And look at them. Actually, they're all marked for you by those colored curves. <laughs> so if we could take all this data and spread it out and overlap all the like transits, that's what we get is this TRAPPIST-1 system. And if you look at the plot on the left, uh, you can see the different planets, TRAPPIST-1b through 1h. And they all are showing you a slightly different shape. The ones that are closer to the star, it's there by Kepler's third law, are orbiting the star faster, so the transit is shorter. And the ones further away have longer eclipses. The depth corresponds to the planet area, and from knowing the planet, the star uh, area, we can extract the planet size. So the size compared, so you can admire the data for a moment. It's truly amazing that there are so many planets all orbiting the same star. But what you may not know or might have forgotten is the TRAPPIST-1 star itself. And that star actually is shown in the cartoon picture right beside Jupiter. And can you see our sun illustrated in that same picture? So look how small that star is. It's barely bigger than Jupiter. TRAPPIST-1 is so small and dim and cold, if it was any smaller, it wouldn't be a star. Any smaller and any lower mass, it wouldn't be able to sustain fusion in its core, and it would actually be a dead brown dwarf. So this is pretty remarkable, and the team that set out to find these ones actually purposely went after the very, very smallest stars. Because in our search for another Earth, we have what we call the race to the bottom. And the point is that we have stars of all sizes. We have blue-white supergiants, red giants. Illustration of our sun is right there. And then we have small red dwarf stars, of which TRAPPIST-1 is one of. Now, do you see the little planet that I put in front of our sun? I want you to look at it now in front of the red dwarf star. It's actually the exact same size black disk, just copy and paste. But when I look at it, to me at least, it looks way bigger in front of the red star. It's an optical illusion, but I just wanted to convey to you what we're doing and why. Uh, why we're doing this. Do you think we're doing this because we think there are the best chances to find habitable worlds and signs of life? Or do you think we're doing it because it's absolutely the easiest thing we can do? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> That's why we're doing it. And so I wanted for a moment to take you on a virtual trip to a planet around a red dwarf star. So imagine for a moment we could get in a spacecraft and zoom to, it would we, I heard a couple questions about interstellar travel, but let's pretend we can do that. We can zoom away to one of these worlds. Here's a bit about what it might look like. Imagine for a moment we're around a planet orbiting a red dwarf star. That star might be very, very big in the sky because the habitable zone, the so-called zone around that star where the temperatures are not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life would be very close to the star. And in some cases that sun or that star would be very big. The artist here has taken an artist's license to make the sky red and to show you other planets um, in the same system, even translating that star. One thing about these planets, they're so close to the star that tidal forces over millions of years or billions of years, we think it's made all the planets tidally locked. Just like the moon shows the same face to Earth at all time, the planet would show the same face to the star at all time. Right? That means that it's um, rotating one time for every time it orbits. That's what our moon is doing. So we think, you know what that would mean if we could go to this planet? Believe it or not, it would mean that that star that sun is in the same place in the sky at all times. So you could choose to go there. Now, would you go and visit where it's always daytime? Uh-uh, because you'd go to the night side where it's always dark, <laughs> where you can do astronomy. <laughs> or you could go where the sun is always setting. I actually would go to where it's always setting to see the green flash. How many of you have seen the green flash? I would just go where I could just watch it kind of last as long as it could. So that would be my favorite thing. Now, about these planets, they're so close to the star that they go around the star quite quickly. So it would be going around. This particular example is, uh, would be going around in about 13 days. So if you're a child, your birthday would be every 13 days. 
Can you imagine having a birthday party every 13 days? Well, it would drive your parents crazy. <laughs> okay, so another thought, going to this planet, even just as a visitor, might not be so great. Remember that little flare we saw in the data? Those of you who saw that little rise? Okay, that was a tiny, tiny little flare in the infrared. So that particular star, which is somewhat quiet, would also have been flaring much more at visible wavelengths, at ultraviolet, at x-ray, all type of particles that are very bad for us. Um, this will make the kids laugh. It would be very bad for your phone. If you flipped your phone out and a big, a part, highly charged particle hit it, it might destroy it. So yeah, it wouldn't be so great to visit because the kids wouldn't be able to play on their phones and we would just, yeah. So these M stars, we're kind of concerned about them for a lot of reasons. It's easy to find planets around them. We don't know if life would be there. People are constantly in the astronomy community fighting back and forth about what's going to happen. Is the ultraviolet radiation going to kill all life, prevent it from developing? Is the uh, X-ray and the winds going to blow the atmosphere away? We don't even know if these TRAPPIST-1 planets have atmospheres. So we're actually opening up a whole new chapter in exoplanets um, by finding planets around these very low mass, very cold stars. So just one more thing, if you'd like to try to find planets, um, do you know that some folks in exoplanets, we do, do look at all their light curves. I mean, we have very sophisticated computer codes that goes through like tons and tons of data from the Kepler Space Telescope, from other space telescopes. We get raw data and we have to clean it up because as stars drift around and the telescope heats and cools down or on the ground day and night, we see a lot of artifacts in our data we don't like. And believe it or not, even professionals will remove the artifacts without always knowing their physical cause. But once there's a cleaned up light curve, you could actually download it yourself and look through it. Or you can go to planethunters.org. Have any of you been to planethunters.org? You can actually look through the data and look for transits. And here's an example. I just pulled this off this morning, but if you start to go on it, it'll put you through a tutorial. That's really fun because you can look for dips and brightness and they kind of collate all of this crowdsourcing stuff. But once you go through the initial one, it turns out that, you know, they actually put fake transits in to train you. So you sort of feel like you might have found a planet and then it was just training. But if you go through the data, it's just absolutely fascinating to see all the different types of stars and how they vary and, and try to find planets. So now I'm moving on to the middle section of my talk about our quest to find the true Earth twin. Because in my mind, We'll do our best to find the planets around small stars. We'll study them and look for water vapor and signs of life in their atmospheres. But ultimately, I think as a human species, we're always after um, the true Earth twin. And so I'm now going to um, tell you a bit about that. Oh, actually, no, I'm not, because I forgot I was going to mention this test first. <laughs> OK, so um, I wanted to tell you about one of the projects, one of the many projects I'm involved with. And this is kind of, this is called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. Um, TESS is an MIT-led NASA mission. It's going to launch in 2018, actually, next March. It's an all-sky survey to find transiting planets, um, transiting bright stars. Now, there are many ways to find planets, um, and the transiting one is just kind of the most popular one today. But should I come back here in 10 years, or 10 years hence after that, it'll be a totally different technique. So I'm going to tell you a bit about this mission. There are four identical telephoto lenses, cameras attached to one platform um, that goes on one spacecraft. And it's going to cover um, the whole sky, the southern hemisphere first, starting in 2018, and followed by the, oops, okay. Here's a, I just wanted you to see the full size of it. It's not really that big of a spacecraft, actually. This is the whole spacecraft. You can see an antenna there. It's just made as an illustration, so you can see the size of the telescope. This bus, the spacecraft bus, actually, is being built by Orbital, S, Orbital ATK. Um, to, beside me is the PI. His name is George Ricker. The next slide is going to show you um, the, okay, this is taken from a few months ago, but this actually is the structure of the spacecraft. We're going to launch on a um, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket out of Cape Canaveral. This is actually the real spacecraft structure that will eventually house the cameras and all of the insides of the spacecraft, the batteries, radio, etc. Here's one of the cameras. This was a prototype, actually. This isn't one of our real flight cameras. But we put our smallest person with the camera, so it looks as big as possible. <laughs> uh, the aperture is only about 10 centimeters. And what you see on the outside there is a giant baffle, actually. It's ribbed on the inside, so in starlight, you know, we don't want to get stray light coming um, into the actual camera. It's actually not just the camera. You know, you could go to the vendor exhibit and purchase. It's completely specially made, custom made, to have no vignetting, 
none of the effects that you would want to um, worry about. The camera is a thermal, so it doesn't heat up and cool down in an awkward way. Um, it has specialized uh, 16 megapixel um, detectors at the bottom there um, inside. So just to show you uh, how large of a field of view tests can cover at one time, I have a series of slides courtesy of Zach Berta Thompson. So this is one degree in the sky. Okay, and I think as astronomers, you're all relatively familiar with scale. And these are simulated images. We're trying to simulate our exact data set. So when our real data comes down, we know what, um, well, we practice finding planets in advance, trying to understand our very specific instrumental effects and what they're going to do to our planet finding and other astronomy goals. And also, so when the data comes down, if it doesn't match up, we'll be better off trying to find out what's wrong. So it's one degree. This is one of our detectors. 12 degrees, so the little square in the top corner, that was the slide from before, one degree, so now this is 12 degrees. But we actually have um, each camera is about 24 degrees by 24 degrees. Again, this is simulated data. And remember I said there were four cameras, right? So one camera would fit within Orion. <laughs> it's big. And remember I told you that there are four cameras, right? on the four identical cameras, telephoto lenses with detectors on the bottom, and that's showing you one strip of the sky that will be observed for a one month period. So the cameras are just pointing, see those blue arrows, they're just pointing in such a way that they're covering a whole strip of the sky. And after one month, we'll move to the next strip, et cetera, et cetera. Now you know you can see the glass half empty or half full, so we like to see it mostly full, but you can see there are gaps on the sky that tests won't cover. So people start to worry, you know, is their favorite star going to fall on silicon or not? <laughs> we don't know yet because we won't know until we launch and get into our orbit. Now the poles will be covered. You can kind of see from this figure, right, how the poles are going to get overlapped. And in those poles, we'll be looking for hundreds of days. So we're going to be uh, finding planets with the transit technique, looking at literally hundreds of thousands of stars, millions of them, really. Uh, we're also getting full frame images, and we're going to have, we're going to just be flooded with data. So the fast track to habitable worlds, that's small planets transiting small stars. Um, and that's kind of the, the take, one of the takeaways. Okay, so now I really am going to move on to the next part of my talk. And that was the future. When we're finished mining the entire sky, imagine that we could find literally every transiting planet around a small star. Um, that would be pretty amazing. But transits are the first part of a long story because we're limited to planetary systems with a fortuitous alignment. We think that stars uh, have rotational axes, and the planets, we're not 100% sure, but we're pretty sure that most of them, except for some rare exceptions of hot Jupiters, that they, the planets orbit in the plane. So some of them will be lined up just so, so that as viewed from the telescope, the planet goes in front of the star. But actually, most of them won't be transiting at all. And so we're limited to, um, because of kind of probability, most of our transiting systems will be quite far away. And if we want to study Earths around the very nearest stars, um, even Earths in general, uh, Earth is quite far from the star. It's hab well, I don't, we don't necessarily feel far from the star, but we are compared to the Trappist worlds. They're very rarely to transit, okay? So this Trappist world, if we wanted to find a transiting Earth, an Earth going in front of a sun, it's about 1 in 200 probability per sun-like star. So you might have to look at 200 stars to find a transiting Earth, but if not all stars have an Earth, it's many more actually, and more stars are further away. So the goal is actually to do another technique. We call it direct imaging. And in direct imaging, we're going to block out the starlight so we can see the planets directly. And here, there just happen to be a few planets in this fake illustration. Now, we can do direct imaging already. And some of you, if you read about exoplanets, you'll read about direct imaging where we block out the starlight. But we're seeing planets like far from their star, like at Pluto's distance. And the stars we're seeing are giant, young, hot planets that are still hot, still luminous from their birth. And so those particular objects are not the Earth twin. They're definitely a step in that direction, but it's not there quite yet. So we do have a, face an incredibly interesting problem when we're thinking about direct imaging, because we want to think about blocking out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. But if we imagine putting a giant circular screen in space or a little tiny block coronagraph inside the telescope, the problem is that the light itself uh, diffracts and acts like a wave. And what you're seeing here is, let's imagine for a moment we could put a perfectly shaped circular screen in space to block out the star. 
we wouldn't block the star out, actually. We would see rings, as you're seeing on the right, an airy ring pattern. And what's happening is that the light is acting like a wave, and it's bending around the edges of this hypothetical screen in space. And those waves there, like the first couple of waves, they're actually far brighter than the planet we would be looking for. This is a analogous to dropping a pebble in a pond. And you see ripples. So that's the thing with light, is that it, acts, it can act like a wave, and it can make ripples that are brighter than the planet we're looking for. So now I want you to imagine, we don't put a big circular screen in space, or a little, or a small, tiny little chronograph inside our telescope, but we put a specially shaped object. That's what's showing you on the left, the mathematical construction of a kind of star shape. Then instead, what you would see, blocking out a point source of a star, you'd see the image on the bottom right. Most of the image would be very, very dark. And the light would be diffracting, but interacting with itself in a mathematically prescribed way so that the light is all pushed to the edges. This would be analogous to dropping a pebble in the pond. But instead of seeing ripples, ripples, the water around your pebble would be perfectly smooth. And all the ripples would be pushed to the edges. Now, believe it or not, this idea was first written about in the 1960s by Lyman Spitzer, the person who helped us get Hubble launched, and who the Spitzer Space Telescope that discovered the Trappist worlds was named after. And it's just incredible that every decade, people revisited the idea. And now it's actually nearly a reality. So I'm going to show you an animation that's going to show you what the star shape is. It's called the star shape. And uh, you can imagine possibly launching a star shape and telescope together. And the petals unfurl from their stowed position. The central hub uh, can expand with the petals undergoing the second stage of deployment. And there they go, they snap into place. Now, in order to block out the starlight to see a true Earth twin, remember I told you it was one in 10 billion? Yeah. Well, these tele this specialized star shape has to be made extremely precisely. The petal shape, the relative position of the petals to each other, and the formation flying, because it's blocking out that starlight that will, so that the planet light will go directly into the space telescope. And they have to be precisely aligned at many tens of thousands of kilometers. Star shape is one of the main projects that I'm most excited about. And here's a few pictures from the star shape lab. So you're supposed to start thinking about what that is. So there's a petal in that picture. Look at that long tip. <laughs> and there's myself and two of my team members. This particular version is built at JPL. There's an, a different design uh, being developed at Northrop Grumman Corporation. Well, here you can see how big this petal is and how big the star shape would be. And the shape uh, has to be manufactured. Uh, so there's like a two-pronged approach to working on the star shape. One of the ways is actually to demonstrate that we can manufacture the star shape to the tolerances required. So if we want to block out the light to one part in 10 billion, the shape has to be just so, and it has to deploy just so as well. Believe it or not, this is one that has been used for real to test. This is a 1% star shape scale. And it's been used in the desert in Death Valley by people from Northrop Grumman to test it out to see if it actually can work the way it's prescribed to. And what they did was they spanned a baseline of about three kilometers, they had an LED that was a star and a planet, and then they had their camera uh, another kilometer away. The star shape was approximately in the middle. <laughs> and they try to measure and see whether they can block out the starlight and see the planet directly. And in fact, they would make defects on the star shape. They would make um, defects on the star shape to see if that matched their mathematical models. Um, people also do demonstrations in the lab with much smaller star shades, 0.1% scale, um, to try to show that it all works. All right, so the search for Earth twins. We need to go to space above the blurry effects of Earth's atmosphere, and we have to really go to a whole new level in terms of blocking out the starlight and seeing the planet directly. And I've only told you one method. There's another way where we use our a specialized space telescope and put a chronograph, a special shape, on the inside of the telescope, but they're both very, very challenging. So in the last um, section of my talk, I'll move on to why we're searching. And believe it or not, one of the questions that I get asked most often um, when I talk to anyone, actually, is we're looking for these planets, we're going to find an Earth, we found some, maybe that are like Earth. Can we go there? 
And so that answers the question I guess most often. I decided not to cover that with you because I know, I'm pretty sure you all know in this audience that we're not gonna be able to travel to those stars anytime soon. And in fact, I think that was a question for the last speaker. So what I answer to them, if you ask me, well, why, why are we looking? That's the next question, why do we look? If we can't go there, why are we trying to find these planets? And one of our main reasons, believe it or not, is the whole search for alien life. And we're not talking about like the arrival that we're gonna meet aliens. Um, we like that, that's what we really do wanna have happen, but we're not expecting that. We're starting at a very, very basic level with the astronomer's tools that we have before us. So we talk about the search for alien life. It's not necessarily for intelligent beings that can send us radio signals or come here in their specialized pods, but it's a search for signs of life, for gases in an atmosphere, gases that don't belong, that we might be able to, with some probability, attribute to life. And this picture is of bacteria, because we don't know, ultimately, if we find this life, we won't know a lot about it. We won't know if it's big or small, if it's simple single-celled bacteria, or animal-like things, or plants. And so to do that, um, I went, was going to say that, you know, science fiction got some things wrong. Because the Star Trek em Enterprise had to travel at incredible speeds over vast distances to orbit other worlds, so that Spock could look at the surface and see if there was, was, were life forms. And sometimes, you know, you get the speakers visiting and it sounds super exciting what we're working on. But like that starshade, people have been working on it like a little bit every decade and for the last decade, huge amounts. It's gonna take us at least another decade to launch it. So I was thinking like if they made a series, a TV series about the regular scientist's life, it would be incredibly boring. <laughs> um, it would just simply be like watching paint dry. So we don't go places, we don't look for stuff, but actually, we look from here. And this is a real image of Hubble Space Telescope from the last servicing mission as it was backing away. And the last servicing mission, they actually put on Wide Field Camera 3, which turned out to have a very stable detector. Hubble orbits Earth every 90 minutes. It goes through orbit day, orbit night, so it heats up a little bit in orbit day, it cools down a little in orbit night. It's not ideal for looking at planet atmospheres, but we actually use it for that. Other, uh, the whole astronomy community people who work on exoplanets actually use it to observe planets. And what we do is we look at spectra. And just for those who don't know what a spectrum is, I have a few slides to convey it. This is showing you a rainbow. And you know what, if you could look at the rainbow closely, zoom in on it, you would actually see that parts of the rainbow are missing. Little teensy little parts of the rainbow are missing due to gases that absorb. And here's a image of the solar spectrum. So this is a taken not with raindrops spreading out sunlight into rainbow, but it's taken by a special telescope and a special instrument called a spectrograph that splits up the light. And do you see the little pieces of the rainbow missing? Believe it or not, each one of these, um, or a set of them, a fingerprint of lines, a set of lines actually um, correspond to gases in our star's atmosphere, in our sun's atmosphere or photosphere. And you actually, if we sat down with a catalog, a library of lines, we could actually do this real thing together and work through which are calcium lines or magnesium or silicon or other things actually. And this is what most of professional astronomy is based upon, is um, in some things you do, you might call it narrow band imaging. You know, you just want to get a simple, very narrow wavelength range. But we want to break up all of the light and study the light at different wavelengths and look for gases. And we are doing this with exoplanets as well. But spectra are required to do any more than what I've talked about up until now. Because, for example, with transits, the transit finding technique, Venus and Earth would look the same. If there are intelligent beings on a nearby Earth looking back at us with an equivalent to Kepler, and they're looking for those tiny drops in brightness as our Earth goes in front of our Sun, they would see Earth and Venus and call them equivalent. They're about the same size. If they could get a mass, they say, oh, they're about the same mass. They are receiving different amounts of energy from the sun, but the other, if the hypothetical aliens wouldn't know um, that Venus has a massive carbon dioxide atmosphere with a huge greenhouse effect. On our Earth, we're worried about adding parts per million of carbon dioxide, which might warm our Earth. But actually, imagine we have an, an Earth out there that has 100 times carbon dioxide that we have, or 1,000, or other greenhouse gases. So until we can study the atmospheres of the other worlds, we don't know, actually, what their surface temperatures are, and whether they are indeed too hot, uh, too cold, or just right for life. So we're looking for atmospheres on other worlds. 
Um, further than that, we actually aim to look for gases that might be produced by life. We call them biosignature gases. Our own Earth's atmosphere was modified uh, incredibly a few billion years ago by cyanobacteria, and today we're here because we can breathe oxygen. But without plants and photosynthetic, photosynthetic bacteria, we would have virtually no oxygen in our atmosphere. Yet our atmosphere is filled with oxygen to 20%. So astronomers love the idea of looking for oxygen on another planet. It's so um, highly reactive, it shouldn't really be there unless something is producing it continuously. I, I just put in one technical slide because I know some of you are in the know and keep up with all the news on exoplanets. And I wanted to just very briefly explain to you that we are measuring atmospheres of exoplanets right now. Now you don't have to understand this slide to understand the rest of my talk, so it's going to be a little detailed. But the one way we find study atmospheres right now is we look at the transiting planets, the planets that go in front of the star. And what we're looking for is the starlight that shines through the atmosphere. Just like shining a flashlight through a fog. Some light makes it through, some doesn't. And by looking at how much light makes it through at different wavelengths, we can actually identify gases in exoplanet atmospheres. This particular graph um, is data taken from the Hubble Space Telescope Wide Field Camera 3 of a hot Jupiter planet. It's a planet that orbits its star in about three days. It's very hot, like 1,500 degrees Kelvin. It's not a rocky world. It's not going to have life. But this is the type of planet whose atmosphere we can study right now. Now, what we're looking at is wavelength in microns. And then we're essentially looking at the size of the planet um, in percent, basically, the depth, transit depth, or the area of the planet in depth. And what I want you to think about, and this is the hard part to understand, is that when the, um, if you imagine the planet for a moment with no atmosphere or transparent wavelength, the starlight makes it through, and the planet appears a certain size. Now think of another wavelength where the atmosphere is very strongly absorbing. The light doesn't make it through. And so that little thin annulus, the little thin like the onion skin in an onion, now makes the onion or that little thin atmosphere makes that planet a tiny bit bigger because the atmosphere is blocking starlight. And so what you're essentially looking at is the planet getting bigger and smaller as a function of wavelength. And we use that to tell us whether or not the planet has an atmosphere. And if the planet looks a little tiny bit bigger at a wavelength that corresponds to like a library of a known gas, we actually can identify that as a gas in another planet's atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is the black points with error bars are data from the Hubble Space Telescope, and the blue and red lines are models. And if this planet had no atmosphere, all you would see is a straight line across. So all you have to agree with me is that what you see here in these points is different from a straight line. <laughs> I'm just smiling because this is like, this actually really is our, among our best data for exoplanet atmospheres. And we see this peak, and that peak lands right where, we, right where water vapor actually is absorbing. And this hot giant planet has water vapor. Now this field of exoplanet atmospheres is one of the main fields I work in. You can ask me questions about it later. It's a very detailed field, and we're really pushing the limits of what Hubble was designed to do and what data analysis techniques can do in order to extract as much information as possible. So in terms of exoplanets, there's so many molecules and so little time. Water is required by all life as we know it. So our first goal for the TRAPPIST-1 planets and other planets like it is to look for water vapor, a sign of liquid water. Our next step will be to look for oxygen. Earth's atmosphere has been highly modified by life by creating so much oxygen. Lots of other gases have been studied. Some you may have heard of some you might not have heard of, like methane, nitrous oxide, methyl chloride, dimethyl sulfide. We have a growing list, actually. And there's this whole new field of exoplanets flourishing, making models about um, what gases could we detect with the James Webb Space Telescope or other telescopes, and which ones, um, you know, how will we know whether they're produced by life or not? That's a growing field right now. And so we require really big telescopes to try to do this, because planets are so small, and their atmospheres are even smaller. And there's an image of the James Webb Space Telescope. And on the right, I put the 30-meter telescope, one of the three extremely large telescopes astronomers are um, trying to construct on the ground right now. So to summarize, there are thousands of exoplanets are known to orbit nearby stars. Most information we have about them is limited to their sizes, masses, and orbits. And remember at the beginning, I showed the chart with all the dots? That's actually most of what we know. Um, our fast track to the search for habitable worlds focuses on small planets transiting small stars. Our next generation telescopes will study exoplanet atmospheres, 
for the search for water and biosignature gases. Now, I know a lot of you um, help out with star parties. You go there and, you know, you set up your telescopes and you, you show other people. Well, what we're aiming for is that one day in the near future, we'll be able to take our friends and family and children to a dark sky site. We might need binoculars, <laughs> but we hope we'll be able to point to a star and to tell them that star has a planet like Earth. Thank you. of it too.